So here's the thought that I had in my mind this weekend. What if every married couple in our congregation made a semper fidelis, semper fi, always faithful commitment to each other? Think about that today. What if every married couple in our congregation were as committed to God and to their marriage as the Marines are to the Marine Corps and to the United States of America? I mean, you know what I'm saying today. What if every couple promised to remain faithful for better or for worse, for richer or for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish till death separated them. Sadly, statistics show that many spouses do not fulfill the commitment that they made, not just to their spouse, but the commitment that they made in the sight and in the very presence of God. Let me say from the very beginning today that my purpose is not to beat you up for any past mistakes. I know many of us are here today, and, and, and we had difficult relationships in the past, and maybe even divorces in the past, and we find ourselves in, in our second marriage, or maybe even our third marriage. My purpose today is, is not to beat you up for that. I am so thankful for the grace of God. Are you not today? Thankful for the grace of God that looks beyond our failures, that looks beyond our mistakes, and loves us and accepts us and embraces us in spite of what we've done in the past. My purpose today is to help you in your present marriage. My purpose today is to help every single man in this building to be a semper fidelis, semper fi, always faithful husband. And my purpose is for every wife here to be a semper fidelis, always faithful wife. We see that in the verse, the brief verse that we're studying today. And so if you have your Bibles in Exodus chapter 20, we're going to read one small verse, five simple words, yet five extremely powerful words. Exodus 20 and verse 14. You shall not commit adultery. Read it with me. Can we read it together? Let's all read it together. Ready? You shall not commit adultery. Now, here's what I want you not to do today. I don't want you to zone me out right away, once again, saying, that's not me. I've never been unfaithful to my wife. Remember when we talked about that small phrase, you shall not murder, and we sat back and said, don't discount, don't act as if that doesn't apply to you because you've never picked up a knife or you've never picked up a gun. So, so don't take this passage of scripture and think today because maybe you have never been involved in an affair that this passage of scripture doesn't speak to you. I submit to you today that it speaks to every single one of us, including myself. So let me read it one more time and then let's go to the Lord in prayer. The Lord simply said this, you shall not commit adultery. Would you pray with me today? Lord, today we bow our heads and we bow our hearts before you. Our prayer, Lord, today is that Jesus would be, will be lifted up in the service. Thank you for the wonderful time of worship that we had and we will have at the conclusion of the service. But Lord, right now, I pray that the Holy Spirit of God would do a work in our hearts. Help us to have open ears. Help us to have open hearts today. Lord, help us today to draw a line in the sand and make a commitment to our spouse, but even more importantly, to make a commitment to you that we will always be faithful to the husband or to the wife that you have given us, <laughs> but most importantly, to you. So God, once again, I pray that you would speak to our hearts today 
And uh, God, do a work in our hearts that only you can do. And it's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. So here's what I want to do. I want to take just a few moments and I want to define the term. So, so, so we read just a few moments ago, the Lord saying, you shall not commit adultery. So I want to define the term both from an Old Testament perspective and then from a New Testament perspective, okay? Are you with me? So if you're following along in your outlines, the very first thing I said is this. In the Old Testament, adultery was defined as any kind of sexual relationship with someone other than your spouse, I think we get that. That's kind of like the traditional view. We understand that, do we not? And so I can't go out and have an affair with another lady. I shouldn't be having a relationship with someone else who is not my wife. And ladies, you should not be having a relationship with someone else who is not your husband. Uh, We get that. That's the traditional view, the Old Testament view. No, No, I would say this. Even during Old Testament times, those biblical regulations were contrary to the customs of the land in which the Israelites were living. And we would sit back today and say, boy, that is a pretty strict command. We live in a very promiscuous society, do we not? We very live in a very um, permissive society, and much goes on. And if we're not careful, it's very easy for us as Christians to adapt to the world in which we're living instead of changing the world in which we're living. And that was taking place even in the Old Testament. It was very easy for the Israelites to look around at their neighbors and say, "Why? well, my word, they have multiple wives and, and they're doing this. Why, let's live like the people around us. Even the Old Testament phrase, the Old Testament command was contrary to culture. It was counter-cultural. So I ask you this morning, why would God ask his people to live differently? Uh, What was it about marriage that made it sacred in God's eyes? Uh, Let me give you a a point that we mentioned a few uh, months ago when we went through the Sermon on the Mount, but but, but we've defined marriage this way. Marriage is is designed by God to be monogamous, heterosexual, and lifelong. That's the way God defines marriage in his word. Now, I know the society in which we live is trying to define marriage differently. But today we want to define it as God defines it. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 24 gives us the very first glimpse of marriage in the Bible. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And so we see in the Old Testament, biblical marriage was a covenant between one man and a woman. Uh, In the Bible, the word covenant is found more than 300 times. And by the way, in, in God's eyes, marriage is not just a contract. Marriage is not just a ceremony. It's not just a public demonstration of the fact that two people want to live together. In God's eyes, marriage is a covenant. And, And the word covenant refers to two or more parties bound together. So... So here's what I want you to see, and this is so very important today as we dig into this topic. Marriage is a triple covenant. You might say, sit back and say, Brian, now, what are you talking about? All right, one man, one woman, triple covenant. Marriage is a triple covenant between the husband, between the wife, and God. It is a threefold cord. It's not just a covenant that I make to my wife. It's not just a covenant that she makes to me. It is a covenant that we make together with God. The book of Malachi talks about this very powerfully. Look with me in Malachi chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. Notice how God speaks to the Israelites. And he says, and in Malachi, he's kind of getting on him. He's castigating him. And he says, the second thing you do, you cover the Lord's altar with tears, with weeping and groaning, because the Lord no longer regards the offering or accepts it with favor from your hand. And so the, the Israelites were complaining, God, why are you not blessing what we're doing? Why 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 are you not accepting our offerings? God says, but but you say, why does he not? 
Because the Lord was witness between you, notice, and the wife of your youth to whom you have been faithless. Though she is your companion, and notice what he says, and your wife, how? By covenants. And, and so it's important for us to realize that marriage is a covenant. And whenever that covenant is violated, it is a serious offense in the eyes of God. So, so God desires to be intimately involved in your marriage. God desires to be intimately involved in my marriage. And so because of that, here's what I want you to catch. We're going somewhere. Because of that, because God is intimately involved in your marriage, catch this. You cannot break the seventh commandment without violating the first two commands of Scripture. You cannot break the seventh commandment without violating the first two commandments. Let me go back and remind you what the first two commandments are. The first commandment was, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all of your might. The second command is worship the Lord and worship him correctly. He is worthy of our worship. So here's what Jesus is saying, or, or, or what, what uh, God is saying in the Old Testament, and Jesus says later, if you violate the seventh commandment, you violate the first two commandments as well. The, those commands are intricately connected together. In other words, you cannot cheat on your wife or on your husband without cheating on God. Now, now, I know that sounds pretty simple for us, but I've had people sit in my office and try to justify an improper relationship with someone else, trying to explain it away, acting as if God is okay with what they are doing. And the order of these commands is so very important. When you cheat on your spouse, you cheat on God. And when you are not faithful to your spouse, you are not faithful to God. Those commands are intimately connected together. So, so here's what Moses is saying or God is saying through Moses. Uh, the, your faithfulness to God must be the foundation of your marriage. G guys, why, why is it so often that we harp on you being the leaders of the home, to be men of God, to be the spiritual leaders, to take the lead in your home, to make sure that your house is built upon a solid foundation? Here's the reason. Because God, your faithfulness to God, must be the foundation of your marriage. And your faithfulness to your spouse, in turn then, should be a reflection of your relationship to God. Listen, I'm faithful to my wife not because I'm a wonderful guy. I probably am, but that's not why, all right? I'm faithful to my wife not because I've never been tempted. I'm faithful to God or, or, or her, not for a variety of reasons, but the most important reason is this, is I want our relationship to be a reflection of the relationship that I have with God. And the closer I get to him, the closer I get to her. And the more I drift away from him, guess what? The easier it is for me to drift away from her. But I want you to see one more truth about adultery from the Old Testament, and then we'll look at the words of Jesus. Uh, put your finger here in Exodus chapter 20 and go with me to Proverbs chapter 6, or take your iPhone or your, your, your iPad and turn with me to Proverbs chapter 6, because in Proverbs chapter 6, the writer of Proverbs says some, some pretty powerful stuff about adultery. Proverbs chapter 6, verses 27 through 30. And before we read the verses, here's what the writer of Proverbs is saying. He's saying, adultery is destructive. I'll tell you right from the get-go what he's saying. Proverbs chapter 6, beginning in verse 7. Can a man take fire next to his chest 
and his clothes not be burned. Pretty simple illustration, right? I got a, I got a torch in front of me. Can I, can I embrace that torch without my clothes catching on fire? Obvious answer, no, all right? Can one walk on hot coals and his feet not be scorched? Obviously, we understand the question of that. It's a rhetorical question. Notice verse 29. He says, so is he who goes into his neighbor's wife. None who touches her will go unpunished. In other words, you can't enter into another relationship and not get burned. You can't enter into another relationship and not get scorched. You cannot do it and not be unpunished. Jump down to verse 32. Notice what he says. He who commits adultery lacks sense. Now, let me just pause for a second and explain what he's talking about there. The word, the word sense in that the Hebrew word literally kind of puzzled me a little bit. It comes from the word from which we get our word hearts. And so the little translation is the, the individual who commits adultery lacks hearts. Uh, some translations translate it, he who commits adultery lacks understanding, lacks perception, lacks wisdom. To commit adultery means that you lack heart. In other words, here's what he's saying. You have a heart problem. That's exactly what the verse is saying. He who commits adultery lacks sense, has a heart problem. He who does it destroys himself. He will get wounds and dishonor. And his disgrace will not be wiped away. Did, did you notice the, the terms of pain in the passage? Did you notice that? Notice the terms of pain. Wounds, dishonor, disgrace. The, those are painful terms. And the writer of Proverbs is saying, is you, if you enter into an illicit relationship, first of all, you lack heart, you lack sense. But even more importantly, pain is coming. You were on the road to dishonor. You were on the road to disgrace. You were on the road to wounds. We say frequently in ministry, I've had the unfortunate opportunity of sitting with men on various occasions who have been unfaithful to their wives. And as a result, they lost their marriages. They lost their families. In some cases, they lost their ministries. And I've said over and over again, I wish you can't, you can't, but I wish I could film them at that moment. And I wish you could see the pain that they are experiencing. And then the pain that their families are experiencing. They would tell you at some some point, was it worth it? No, obviously it wasn't worth it. But the pleasure of the moment, the enticement of another relationship, allowing someone else in their life was so strong that at that moment they failed to realize that they were taking fire into their bosom. At that moment, they failed to realize that they were walking on hot coals. And as a result, their life was destroyed. The Old Testament is clear as to the destructive nature of adultery. We understand that. So so here's what the Old Testament says. The Old Testament says that adultery very simply is an intimate sexual relationship with someone who is not your spouse. But what does Jesus say? And we could stop right there and and possibly a good number of us could walk out today, pat ourselves on the back and say, another command that I'm knocking off. God is really pleased with me. And, And by the way, I trust that the purpose of studying these commands is not so that we can necessarily feel better about ourselves. The purpose of these commands is not just for us to sit back and say, okay, five out of 10. (laughs) Six out of 10, seven out of 10, I'm doing pretty good. No, the purpose of these commands is to examine our lives, to examine our hearts in the light of God's word. So so what does Jesus then say 
about adultery. Surely his compassionate spirit, his forgiving nature will cause him to not speak as strongly about such a delicate subject as Moses did in the Old Testament, right? Turn with me to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. Several months ago, we studied this as we studied the Sermon on the Mount, and you will be reminded of these words, but you will see in Matthew chapter 5 that Jesus once again takes that Old Testament command and he raises the bar. In other words, he ups the ante. He ups the expectations. Matthew chapter 5, verses 27 and 28. Notice what Jesus said. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. And all the Pharisees would sit back and say, yeah, we've heard that and we have kept it, even though they hadn't kept it. But you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But notice what Jesus says. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. I'm going to read that again because that, that, that's pretty powerful stuff. That is, that, that is counter-cultural stuff, all right? But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. I say that's counter-cultural because one of the main thrusts of our culture is that of the sexual erotic desire. And our culture is constantly bombarding our minds and our eyes with images that would cause us, especially as men, that would cause us to have thoughts that do not honor our wives and most certainly do not honor God. So so follow me, in the Old Testament, adultery was defined and described as an act, A-C-T, an act of unfaithfulness. But in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus takes it a step further. Here's what Jesus says. He says adultery is not just an act, but adultery is an attitude. Adultery is not just an act, but it's an attitude. Catch this, and and I know this applies to ladies too, but but I'm a guy, guys, so so I know what we struggle with, okay? Here's what Jesus is saying. He's saying, You can commit adultery without being physically unfaithful to your spouse. That's exactly what Jesus is saying. You can commit adultery without being physically unfaithful to your spouse. You might sit back and say, Brian, how is that possible? Notice the second thing that I wrote. Adultery is committed in the heart before it is acted on in the body. Adultery is committed with the heart before it is acted on with the body. Go back with me and look at that verse, what Jesus says in verse 28. He says, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman, notice he says, with lustful intent. Now that's kind of a a phrase that maybe we don't get, and so we kind of write it off just a little bit. But let let me unpack that for you for just a moment, all right? The, the word lust there is a word that is used 16 times in the New Testament. It's translated, it's not always translated lust, but it's translated to covet. It's translated to crave. It's translated to desire. So, so in other words, you can crave a big bowl of ice cream, all right? You can lust after a nice, juicy steak, all right? I don't know what you're planning on having for lunch, but I'm kind of uh, wetting the, uh, the whistle there just a little bit, all right? It means to covet, to crave, to desire, to lust after. It has the idea of an intense, passionate desire. The ancient Christians believed lust was one of the seven deadly sins, So so here's what Jesus does in the passage. He intensifies the adultery discussion by saying that desiring another woman in your mind is committing adultery in your hearts. 
desiring another woman in your mind, whether it's in person, whether it's somebody that you walk by, whether it's somebody on the big screen, whether it's somebody that you work with, maybe it's somebody you see in a magazine, whoever it is, you don't even have to meet that person, but desiring someone in your mind, fantasizing about it, thinking about it, dwelling on it, Here's what Jesus says. You might not have committed the biological, physical act of adultery, but you have already violated the seventh command. And you have dishonored God, and in the process, you are, you are dishonoring your wife. Adultery is a heart issue. It is not just a physical action. Do we get that? I know it's got really quiet here today. Let me show you the words of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a, was a Lutheran pastor that ministered in Germany around the time of World War II. What a, one of my spiritual heroes, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, makes this statement. He's talking, he says, at that moment, he's talking about the moment of temptation. Whenever, whenever we give in to the temptation, he said, at that moment, God loses all reality for us. So, so here's what's happened. I'm flipping through the channels at night. And all of a sudden, I see something that is enticing to me. I see something that I know I probably shouldn't be looking at, but, but, but my mind likes it. I like it. At that moment, what happens? God loses all reality. Bible's closed, set to the side. Here's what he says. Satan doesn't fill us with a hatred of God, but with a forgetfulness of God. So at that moment, we don't, we don't become public atheists and say, I'm, I'm denying God. But at that moment, we become practical atheists. Because at that moment, God is no longer in our mind and in our heart, and we are focusing on that which my sinful nature craves. And at that moment, I forget about God. Jesus says adultery is not just an act, but adultery is an attitude as well. So let me carry that one step further before we get really practical today. I want to give you something practical. I'm going to give you something you can put in your pocket and, and work on this week. But if you're following along in your notes, the next thing I wrote is this. Every act of sexual immorality is spiritual desecration. I mean, we would be appalled if... if if we would have came in here today and someone would have taken paint and thrown it all over our walls. We would have sat back and said, that's appalling. Why would someone desecrate the temple of God? Or what if someone would have came in and put, you know, derogatory symbols all around the building? We would sit back and we would be angered about that because, because the temple of God was desecrated. Here's what I want you to catch and I want me to catch as well. Every single act of sexual immorality, whether it's with the body or whether it's in the mind, whether it's done publicly or whether it's done privately, whether someone else is involved or whether it's just us that's involved, every single act of sexual immorality is spiritual desecration. Notice these verses, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. You know these verses. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit of God, or the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price. So glorify God with your body. Glorify God with your mind. Glorify God with your heart. As a believer, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit of God. To commit adultery or fornication is to defile God's temple. Let me say that again. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit of God. 
to commit adultery, to commit fornication, to look at pornography, to watch something on television that arouses desires within you that cannot be righteously fulfilled. To do that is to take paint, sinful paint, and desecrate the temple of your heart, which does not belong to you or me. It belongs to God. Today we're talking about marriage, but but let me just pause because I know we have a lot of young people around the room and unmarried people around the room as well. Sex outside of marriage defiles God's temple as well. So we might sit back today and and be critical of somebody who is not being faithful to their spouse, But, but to live in a way, to use our bodies in a way at a time that does not honor God is destructive. It, it, is, it is spiritual desecration of God's temple. L- listen, I get it. I get it. What I'm telling you today is completely countercultural. We live in a culture that, that, that elevates sex to God-like status. You can't turn on your television anymore without watching something. It's very difficult to go to the movie theater and watch something. And if we're not careful, we can sit back as believers and say, I'm immune to it. (laughs) It doesn't affect me. Really? I mean, quite honestly, does it not affect you? Every day, it affects us. And so the challenge for us, and and by the way, By the way, whenever, guys, whenever I look at something, and I would say this, we haven't had a pornography discussion with our men yet, and we probably will uh, in the near future, and we might sit back and say we have the most holy, righteous, godly church in South Florida, but pornography is something that not only do unbelieving men struggle with, but Christian men struggle with. As a matter of fact, if the statistics bear true in our congregation, Probably more than 50% of the men are struggling with it to one degree or another. Guys, whenever you look at something like that, whether it's quickly, whether you dwell on it, whether you pause and look on it, when you look at that, you not only dishonor God, but I want you to catch this, you dishonor your wife when you do that. And you violate that threefold covenant of marriage. So when God looks at us and he says, you shall not commit adultery, he's not just talking about what we do with our bodies, but he's talking about what we do with our minds. He's talking about what we do with our hearts. He's talking about what we look at, what we dwell on, what excites us, what distracts us. And God in his holiness says, Do not commit adultery. Your body, your heart, your mind belong to me. So can I get practical today? And I know I might step on a few toes today. One of our guys wrote me and said, Brian, I think you're going to step on our toes tomorrow. He wrote me yesterday, and I said, yeah, please be sure and wear steel-toed shoes to church today. Let me just give you a couple practical tips, all right? These are, these are practical tips to help you. The first is this. Be careful what you watch. Be careful what you watch. Here's the words of David. I didn't put it up on the screen. David says this. I will set nothing wicked before my eyes. I, I will not look at anything that does not honor God. I've already mentioned pornography. To look at pornography is to be unfaithful to your wife. It's sinful. I would tell you to be very careful what you watch on television, sex on television, sex at the theater. Guys, let's be honest. You cannot watch those illicit scenes on television or on the movie theater without it affecting your mind. It does. We can sit back and we can be holy and righteous and say, no, I'm watching it in the privacy of my home. Nobody else knows. It's just me and my wife. Your mind is wired just like my mind. And at some point, those thoughts come back to us. 
and we dwell on those things. Don't have roaming eyes, guys. When you're walking to the mall or whatever, keep your eyes on your wife. Don't have roaming eyes. Be careful what you watch. Let me give you a, a second thing. Be careful what you say. Be careful what you say. Here's something that's just so practical, but, but it, 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 I find that for some reason we just don't get it. Don't share intimate thoughts with anyone else but your spouse. Uh, you guys know I'm all over Facebook, all right? I love Facebook. I love Twitter. I love all of that. That's cool stuff, all right? But you got to be careful who you're sharing things with. You got to be share, careful who you're sharing intimate details of your life with. Those intimate details should be shared with your spouse, with your husband, with your wife alone. Do not share them with anyone else. Here, here's another great thing never complain about your husband or your wife to somebody else. Well, man, you have no idea what my husband does. I'm telling you. If anybody could complain about their husband, it would be Vicky. all right? I'm, a, I'm being dead serious, and she's shaking her head because she knows how true it is. She's sitting back saying, you're exactly right, because I stand up and act like I'm the greatest guy in the world, and you might walk away thinking, man, I wish my husband was like Brian. No, you don't wish your husband was like Brian, all right? I can be an idiot sometimes. I can be insensitive sometimes. I can be disinterested sometimes. I can be selfish sometimes. I can be self-centered sometimes. Vicki would say, that's right, just take out the word sometimes. It's probably most of the time. And it would be really easy for her to complain about me to somebody else. But she doesn't do it. She doesn't do it. Why? Because that's a conversation between us. And, and she doesn't need to be sharing that, I mean, with other ladies, but specifically with other men. Be careful what you say. I would go so far as to this. Husbands, wives, I'd make sure that you both have access to each other's phones. That you have access to each other's Facebook accounts. Why is that? Because there's nothing that can be hidden. Vicki Vicky doesn't have a Facebook account. Guess whose Facebook account she uses? Mine. All right? Now, now, I don't know whether she does it because she doesn't trust me or just because she doesn't want one. I'm not sure what's the motivation, but she has mine. And I don't have a problem with that. Why? Because you know what that means? That means that I cannot put anything on there that would dishonor her. My phone is open to her. She knows what my phone code is. So at any given moment, she can grab my phone, type in my phone code, and see who have I been calling, who have I been talking to, who have I been text messaging. You might sit back and say, well, that's an invasion of my privacy. No, it's not, because you're one flesh before God. <laughs> Genesis 2.24. Genesis 2.24 says that you left your mommy and your daddy, and you joined to your wife, and your wife became your flesh. Does my right hand know what my left hand's doing? Certainly it does. Does my right foot know what my left foot is doing? Certainly it does. Why? Because we belong to the same body. Be careful. Be careful what you say. Be careful who you are with. Be careful. Listen, our emotions, your heart will deceive you. Your heart will trick you. Some people say all the time, I'm just following my heart. Don't follow your heart. Jeremiah says that your heart is deceitful. It's desperately wicked. Why would you follow something that's sinful? Don't follow your heart. I have, a, I have a rule. I am never alone with a lady who is not my spouse without, without a window in the door, without anything like that. I, I'm never that way. You sit back and say, why, Brian? You're just holy. I'm not. I know I'm sinful. I know I'm capable of falling. I've had too many pastor friends that have fallen in this. We're not above falling. But I realize that if I never, ever, ever put myself in that situation, guess what? I don't ever have to worry about giving in to temptation. Be careful who you are with. I want to say one more thing, and I hope my, if I step on your toes, I step on your toes, but it's so important. Ladies, be careful how you dress. 
Be careful how you dress. Don't give another man an opportunity to lust after you. Your body was created for your husband. Dress to please your husband and to please him alone. Those are direct things. I know that. But the simple truth is this. Your marriage was designed to reflect the gospel. That's why God brought you and your wife together, not so that you would just have a happy, wonderful life with a lot of kids, and that's part of it, but you were brought together to reflect the gospel of Jesus Christ. And in order for that to happen, we need to be faithful to, or as faithful to our spouse as God is to us. I'm done. i got to be done. The third thing is this. Beware of committing spiritual adultery. Beware of committing, throughout the Old Testament, God uses adultery as a description for Israel's unfaithfulness. I'll give you both points. Spiritual adultery is unfaithfulness to God. Spiritual adultery is unfaithful to God. And here's the other thing. You cannot have an intimate friendship with the world and be faithful to God at the exact same time. You can't. Here's what James says. He says, and by the way, we... We're critical of uh, of Israel as being adulterous to God. Here's what James says. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Hey, hey, listen, listen. We've been called to be countercultural. We haven't been called to go with the currents. We've been called to swim upstream. We've been called to go against the flow. We've been called to be holy and righteous and just and to be lights in the midst of a dark world. That happens with our marriages as well. How can you test your faithfulness to God? Our praise team is going to come out in just a second. Let me just give you a couple of questions as they come. Do you communicate regularly with him? Do you talk more to God than you do someone else? If I spoke more to another lady than my wife, I wouldn't be faithful to her. If I'm, if I'm not regularly communicating with the Lord, am I being faithful to him? Is pleasing him the most important thing to you? Do you place his desires above your desires? Is his will go above your desires? Are the things that are most important to him important to you? So God says this, you shall not commit adultery. What does that mean? It means God's will is for you to be completely faithful to your spouse and completely faithful to him. Does that make sense, church? That's what God wants for us. That's what God wants for you. Guys, I know we live in a culture that it's really difficult to Listen, let me, let me tell you, and I need to learn this too. D- d- did you realize, God, that there is, guys, that there's an off button on the television control? <laughs> did you know that? The, there, is a, the, there is a channel switcher on the television control. The, 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 there's also, when you go into the movie theater, you don't have to go to that movie. Be careful what you're watching on the computer when your spouse isn't around. Why? Because you're a child of the living God. And as a child of the living God, you want to reflect him in every aspect of your life, including your marriage.